All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself and then I'll pass it off to my colleague here. Um, those of you who are um, who have spoken with me before via email or had one on one appointments with me um, or who haven't. Uh, my name is Heather Reynolds and I am the Associate Director of International Admissions here at Claremont Graduate University. Um, I've been working at Claremont for about five years now, uh, working in different capacities um, in the admissions um, office. Um, I moved from working specifically with the international or with the um, information systems and technology program to working specifically with our international students. So I support all of our recruiters with their international student um, strategies and efforts. Um, and thank you all for joining today. And I'll go ahead and pass it off to my colleague. Hi, everybody. My name is Marcus Weekly. I am the director of the International Scholars Program. Amongst a few other roles, I'm also the director of the Center for Writing and Rhetoric and an assistant professor of transdisciplinary studies at CGU. Um, I see a few familiar names and a few new, new names. Welcome all of you um, today. Uh, we're just going to provide, you know, hopefully a helpful overview of the International Scholars Program, um, and then combine that with the next step. So try to provide some transparency through the process and through how what the program is all about and then how it works for you to just kind of help the transition. So um, to get started, we'll begin with, a, with an overview and, I, and I'll break this up into a few parts. So the, the, the first part is really the benefits of the International Scholars Program. So a few, a few key things that I wanna to touch on and a lot of them really revolve around the fact that the format of the International Scholars Program is an English for academic purposes program. So this is a very strategic and intentional design um, and it is, uh, it's important because what it does is it takes a, a traditional English language program and it centers all the learning around um, academic contexts, right? So in our case, specifically graduate level academic contexts. Okay, so in, instead of the other, instead of an English language program that might choose any sort of topic or, um, you know, any, any type of uh, maybe writing, let's say, or, or, or conversation to help develop fluency in a language. An English for Academic Purposes program specifically provides language improvement through the types of speaking, the types of listening, the types of writing, and the types of research you are going to be doing in graduate school, right? So what it ends up doing is providing a multifaceted um, pedagogical uh, purpose in that you will be learning academic conventions, expectations and graduate level audience. So what that means is um, what are professors going to be looking for in graduate school when you turn in writing? What are they gonna be looking for when you um, con contribute to a classroom discussion? What are they expecting when you have to present your work at the end of a, at the end of a seminar, right? When you're doing a class presentation or, or what does group work look like? So all of those are genuine academic contexts, right? And we're through the English for Academic Purposes model, teaching you about all of those while simultaneously teaching you about English, right? And, and improving your fluency in English. And more specifically, the English you'll often use in those scenarios in graduate school. Um, and, that's, and that's important because the outcome then is, is really honed in on, it's really focused on preparing you to succeed in your degree program, right? As well as, again, improving your fluency in English. So um, an, another important aspect, which I've touched on, but I think is, is really essential here is that this is a graduate only design, right? A graduate level design. This is um, not really a mixed group or, um, you know, uh, accepting a full, a full range of, of um, either academic or English fluency ability. What it's really doing is saying, okay, 
what are the specific graduate academic contexts, right? So that that's going to shift the type of writing we teach. Um, it's going to shift the type of reading and annotation, the type of research um, context that we that that we teach. And of course, the same is true on the speaking and listening side. So it really hones in the program for for graduate students, um, and for importantly graduate students in North American classroom context. So that's the last really, I think key benefit is that um, there are going to be, you know, when I talk about expectations and audience, the sorts of unique things um, that we're gonna try to, you know, to, to, to work on in the program along with English fluency. Um, you know, a lot of these things are, are you can think of as, as culture, right? This is North American, academic culture. So the classroom looks a certain way, your relationship with the professor is going to be expressed in, in a certain way. And oftentimes this is gonna be different than, than what you've experienced growing up um, in your home country or maybe what you've experienced if you've, even if you've studied, let's say in Europe or um, in Latin America, you know, uh, cultures that you might consider to be, you know, you, you might think they're similar, the academic cultures might be similar, but still there are gonna be these unique differences, right? That a North American classroom, um, especially at the graduate level, a lot, of, uh, a lot of professors will just kind of live it, right? They'll just kind of expect you to know. Um, if, if you're not taught explicitly what these practices are, you're more or less tasked with figuring them out as you go along, right? So. Um, another benefit of the International Scholars Program, in my opinion, is that we do work through very explicitly, this is a cultural practice. This is just what, what happens in the North American classroom in graduate school, and this is how you can um, interact with it more, more seamlessly. So, um, you know, touching, touching on the benefits now, uh, let's move to the, the, the courses and structures. So kind of the details of what the International Scholars Program is specifically. So it's broken into two tiers, tier one and tier two, and the required uh, um, taking of either of these tiers, the requirement is based on your TOEFL or IELTS score, right? So you might be required to take both tier one and tier two, or you might test just into tier two. Either way, you can take both if you would like. Um, and we do offer you know, similar courses as well to all international students that are very similar to the ones that, that, that must be taken as a requirement as part of the Pathways program for ISP. Tier one entrance requirements, TOEFL 75 to 84, IELTS 6.0. And for tier two, it's TOEFL 85 to 94, IELTS 7.0 with no section um, below a 6.5. So what the two tiers look like, um, academic writing and research one, academic listening and speaking one for tier one, and then hopefully in a non-confusing way, academic writing and research two and academic listening and speaking two. So these are streamlined courses that are combining in one case writing and research and in the other listening and speaking um, on, on a two tiered model. To, to really flow from one to the other and to provide an iterative structure of learning. So what that means is in 201, academic writing and research, you're going to focus on writing skills. That's gonna be reading academic texts, annotating academic texts, outlining a final writing project, um, working with sources, maybe working with data to produce a draft of that writing project, the final assignment of a course, let's say, and then how do you work with that draft to revise it to produce a final version, right? Um, so all of that's gonna be covered in tier one, and then it's going to be more broadly and deeply covered in tier two. So you'll learn elements of all of those aspects of the writing and research process and in tier one, and then tier two will cover some new topics, but some of the topics covered in tier one in a, in a deeper way. So it provides an iterative structure 
of learning. Um, language learning is an iterative process. The more you interact in a language, the better you get at it. I mean, that seems quite commonsensical, right? Quite straightforward. I mean, the same is true of writing and especially academic English can even be thought of sometimes as a different language than conversational English, right? So there's, there's a lot of bridges to cross and understanding um, how to approach different contexts in terms of writing and research. And so doing it a few times in first, um, you know, I, I wanna say like uh, a first pass or you cover certain elements of a topic and then returning to that topic to cover the rest more deeply can really be a helpful way to approach these sorts of things. So that's the idea of the two tiers. And, and the same thing is gonna happen with the listening and speaking courses. In those, we're going to focus on class discussions, um, giving presentations, listening to lectures, and taking notes, how to take notes for listening to lectures, um, and then some elements of pronunciation as well. And so those will be covered again in tier one and then recovered and expanded in tier two, um, you know, with more robust final projects and things like that where you're asked to give a fuller formal presentation. And then there is an option as part of tier two, uh, TNDY 304, that's, that's a, a transdisciplinary course, 304, traversing the transdisciplinary experience. That'll be often as offered as an intensive um, for summer semesters. Uh, it'll be held the last two weeks of summer semester for you know, between two and three hours every day fully in person. And this is more or less an introduction to transdisciplinary research. So we'll cover a bit about systems thinking, a bit about um, multidisciplinary research, interdisciplinary research, and then transdisciplinary research, what it looks like to approach research problems um, from a transdisciplinary perspective, and then how to develop a transdisciplinary research project out of looking at a problem um, in greater complexity. So really an interesting course, I think, and um, uh, a great way to really dive into an in-person course uh, at CGU as part of ISP um, in, in a class that will be you know, a mixed class. There will be some students just taking it for their transdisciplinary credit, but also it is tailored towards international students as well. So it, it'll be, um, a good scaffolded introduction to coursework at CGU. Finally, we're making a big change in the modality of the International Scholars Program. So I wanted to cover in depth what that means and what it looks like. So um, the ISP program moving forward will be primarily an asynchronous program. So asynchronous more or less means done at your own time. Right, there isn't a set three hours on a specific day where you must either log on online or be in person and present to attend class. The class is always there. It'll be um, offered through our learning management software, Canvas. So you will have Canvas courses that'll have what are called modules. That's just the terminology of Canvas. And you'll work through these modules that'll have different elements in it. Uh, some examples will be readings, pre-recorded lectures or videos, handouts, um, online discussions where you'll be responding to a prompt and you'll be able to see what other students either at the same time as you or who have taken the course at different times, what they've responded to the same prompts. And you'll, you'll keep the conversation going. Uh, you might, be asked to take some quizzes. And then you will be asked definitely to record yourself presenting or speaking various things and to write drafts of assignments and, and turn those in. So all of that will be set up in a, in a nice flow, streamlined way where you start at the beginning and um, will be asked to kind of work through step-by-step step, and you can do this really when it fits into your schedule. Uh, there will be some limitations on when you can begin because it will uh, take you time to get through it, right? So the idea is if you 
are required or are choosing to take tier one, um, that you begin the tier one module anytime during the first three weeks of module one. So during summer, that's typically the middle of May to the beginning of June. In fall, that's gonna be really the first three weeks of September, maybe the last week of August into the second week of September. And if it's spring, uh, spring is usually the last two weeks of January and the first week of February. So you must begin within those three weeks, but then at that point, you have the entire rest of the semester to finish both tier one and tier two. Okay, so that is usually going to be the next 12 to 13 weeks, if I am correct? Yes, I believe so, 16 weeks semester. So you'll still have that chunk of time and the course is designed, the courses are designed for you to complete in that amount of time, okay? Tier one is designed to not take as long as tier two. If you test directly into and choose only to take tier two, you have to begin tier two again anytime before the third week of module two, which begins halfway through each semester. So all the academic calendars are um, on the CGU website. And of course, we can answer those questions by reaching, by reaching out to us directly at the International Scholars Program if you have any questions about exactly the guidelines for the start dates. But there is some flexibility there. And hopefully, that is helpful for you to be able to begin at those different times. But you will be required to complete all of the courses by the end of um, the semester before you would like to begin your coursework. So is it all asynchronous? Is it all just there and you do it all on your own? No, not at all. Um, where we've actually woven in a substantial amount of synchronous components. So that means live one-on-one -on -one or maybe small group components where you'll be meeting with an ISP staff member or instructor um, about course content um, or to do uh, assessments, which means to do, you know, graded activities. So you'll definitely um, start off with meeting with someone before you begin any of the courses online asynchronously and uh, be introduced, you know, answer any questions. You'll hopefully be working with the same person throughout. And then at a number of different points through the courses, you'll be required to stop um, and meet with someone before you progress to the next part of the course. Um, and there are a number of different reasons for that. Uh, again, some of them are going to be because you will have to do things that will be graded in that session, that one-on-one -on -one session. But we also wanna ensure that you're doing well in the course. Um, according or you know, connectedly, you're going to have the option to meet one-on-one -on -one with ISP staff more often than that if you would like. So there are going to be a number of program assistants um, available at any given time that whose schedules you will receive, and you'll be able to make appointments with them uh, to talk about course content, to get any questions answered about assignments, um, any, any sort of thing that might come up for you as you're completing the asynchronous courses, you will be able to meet with ISP staff um, live. Right? And uh, we'll do our best to always have a diverse range of availability, right? So depending if you are doing it from, from a different time zone, hopefully we will be able to find a relatively convenient time for you. And then finally, you know, the, the Student Life and Diversity Center, um, the Center for Writing and Rhetoric, and then the other programs offered by ISP, the International Scholars Program, will still be running even over summer um, and fall and spring. There will be activities most of which are still offered um, at least hybrid or online. So you will be able to attend, even if you are completing the course asynchronously and remotely from your home country or somewhere else in the world, you'll still be able to engage with, camp with campus events. And over summer, finally, uh, if there is um, a good sized group of, uh, of folks already, you know, students already in person in Claremont, we will in those cases hold weekly content sessions apart from the TNDY course uh, to kind of, you know, to, to work through what uh, the, the sorts of materials that are on the asynchronous courses 
um, and just kind of do you know the equivalent of a one-on-one, -on -one, but in but in a small group structure. So our goal here to provide the flexibility and the benefits, and also the reduced cost of being able to take a course asynchronously before you begin your coursework, um, fitting into your own schedule, and um, ideally into you know the variable circumstances that can come up when you're working to attend uh, graduate school abroad. But at the same time, providing you with enough hands-on, one-on-one opportunities, not only through campus events, but definitely through working with ISP staff on the material that we're still providing a robust pathways program in the English for academic purposes modality, or um, I don't wanna to be too confusing. So the English for academic purposes format, um, where we are introducing a lot of new content too, in terms of academic conventions and things like that. So we can still provide that sort of robustness to the program, but in a way that also offers the convenience of of, uh, of an asynchronous modality. So we understand that this might be tricky at first to get used to if you've never done an asynchronous course before. So we're gonna provide a lot of the instruction up front. Um, and again, the, the initial sessions when you are meeting with ISP staff will really be to ensure that you get into the rhythm and understand the structure of how this sort of thing works. So <clears throat> now that we've talked through um, the, the new modality of the ISP program, um, the benefits of the ISP program, um, the, the courses and things like that, let's talk a little bit about um, how to enroll in ISP. So at this point, the first thing I want to bring to your attention is um, our updated fees. So for the new Inter International Scholars Program for Tier 1, it's $2,000. For tier two, it's $2,000 as well. And for those of you who decide to um, enroll in the optional in-person TNDY course, um, it is an additional 3,960 because that is um, part of our tuition structure here at CGU. Um, so depending on uh, which tiers you are required to complete, it's um, a significantly less than our previous um, our, our previous uh, program there where it was running for about, I believe about $12,000 for the entire program. So, you know, with the flexibility and everything, we've been able to kind of reduce the costs uh, for our incoming students. Um, just to kind of note for you all, um, if you were awarded any departmental merit-based fellowship, um, these fellowships unfortunately cannot be applied to these tier one or tier two fees. However, um, if you do opt into that uh, tier two optional course, um, you will uh, be able to utilize a prorated amount of your departmental fellowship for that um, tuition fee cost as well. Um, just a few dates to kind of keep in mind as you're kind of thinking through enrollment. Um, uh, for the upcoming terms. The first thing that you'll want to consider is your deposit deadline. So once you've been admitted into your program, you will also see um, on your admissions letter if you were admitted into the interna International Scholars Program as well. And if you were, you want to pay attention to the deposit deadline on the um, uh, one of the last pages of your official admissions letter. You'll also want to pay attention to um, the summer or, and fall fees, uh, the due dates. So usually for the summer and fall, um, as Marcus mentioned a little bit, um, they start uh, for summer and fall, at least summer usually starts in uh, May, and then fall usually starts end of August, um, beginning of September. And so the fees are usually due um, about four weeks after the start of term. So you'll want to take a look at the academic calendar for your, um, your intake semester. The other date that you'll want to keep in mind as well, um, the first day of courses that I just mentioned. So knowing those times can kind of help you calculate when the summer and fall fees are going to be due. And then you'll also want to pay attention to the last day to add or drop any courses for that semester. 
Usually it's about the second or third week of the term that you are enrolled in to adjust um, your schedule accordingly. And then about a week or so after that is when the fees are due. So those are just some things to kind of keep in mind as you're planning your enrollment um, in ISP, as well as enrollment for your uh, program uh, specific courses as well. So with those things in mind, um, we want to talk through what are your next steps for enrollment. So as I mentioned before, um, you receive your admissions letter, you see that you are required to complete ISP, or you've even heard about ISP and you're interested in enrolling for some of those courses to help you kind of get acclimated into, you know, uh, North American type of academic research. So the things that you'll want to keep in mind about is first things first, submit that tuition deposit. That tuition deposit will let us know that you plan on enrolling for the upcoming term. We'll secure any um, funding that you've been awarded at that point, and we'll just um, secure your seat for the ISP program as well as for your uh, departmental specific program as well. So for those of you who are planning on taking any in-person courses um, over the summer, so that TND, TNDY course that we mentioned uh, before, you'll also want to begin the visa process there. Um, at the time of your tuition deposit, you should be receiving communication from our International Services Office to begin uh, submitting I-20 materials if you are applying for an F-1 visa, as well as um, uh, materials for a request for a DS-2019 if you are applying for a J-1 visa. So you'll want to make sure that if you plan on coming in person, you want to start that visa process as early as possible so you can have time to um, get through the entire process before getting here for the summer or fall terms. At the same time of visa processing, if it's required of you, if you plan on taking fully online or you, if you plan on taking the ISP program fully online in your home country, You'll also want to <clears throat> begin the pre-advising process. And this will happen for both those of you who are planning on coming in person, as well as those who plan on completing ISP fully online. So you will be connected. You should be receiving, I guess, communication from the student support specialist for, from your degree program or your department to schedule what we call pre-advising. In that pre-advising appointment, They'll talk through how to log into your student accounts, how to log into your uh, CGU email, and they'll also be asking you to fill out the enrollment financial agreement form as well. They'll either ask you to complete that before the meeting or if you're having any issues with, um, <clears throat> with completing that on your own they can walk through the process with you as well. So they will go over a lot of really important information with you in that pre-advising meeting. After you complete your pre-advising, then you'll be, you'll be connected with me as well as your program coordinator. So you will be connected with me in order to enroll you in your ISP courses. So <clears throat> after you've completed your pre-advising and the enrollment financial agreement, I will automatically enroll you in either tier one or tier two or, I, or both um, if um, that is required of you. And then you will also at the same time be connected with your program specific coordinator. And in that meeting, they will talk through what courses that you'll need to complete or that you'll need to enroll in for your uh, program specific um, courses there. So at the same time, you'll be enrolled in your ISP courses, and then you will also be enrolled for a future term um, for your program courses there. So that way, once you're done with the ISP program, you can seamlessly um, continue on into your, um, into your master's or your doctoral program. As soon as you are enrolled um, uh, in the ISP program, I will send you a confirmation email with the courses that I've enrolled you in. And then after that confirmation email, within the next couple of weeks, you will have an initial meeting with the ISP instructors 
to schedule those synchronous types of meetings that we discussed um, in the modality section of this presentation there. Um, you'll want to be sure as soon as you're completed with pre-advising, begin making it a habit to check your CGU uh, student email because that's where a lot of communications will be coming to you at that point, as including this initial meeting with the ISP instructors and staff. So in that meeting, you know, they'll talk through, you know, um, uh, time zone differences. So if you are completing it uh, fully online in your home country, they'll help try to figure out, okay, what's a good time for you to schedule some one-on-one -on -one meetings um, and help you, <clears throat> excuse me, create your, your plan to complete the ISP program. Once you do all of that, you'll be connected to the Canvas courses uh, that Marcus uh, uh, referred to a little bit early on. And then once you're connected with the Canvas courses, you just go ahead and start your asynchronous as well as synchronous programming, get it done by the end of the term, and then you're good to go for your master's or doctoral program. So at this point, um, those are your next steps. If you haven't already been in touch with me regarding um, enrolling for the future term or scheduled your pre-advising appointment, feel free to connect with me. Um, if you haven't heard from your student support specialist, um, connect with me and I can figure out um, who your student support specialist, we can get your meeting scheduled and get you enrolled um, in ISP as well as your, your program uh, specific courses. But I just wanted to thank you all for joining us. Um, hopefully you learned a little bit more about our ISP program, the benefits, the modality, the flexibility, um, and then what you need to do as far as next steps. Um, at this point, we'll go ahead and um, stop the recording and we'll open it up to questions for those of you who are here. Yeah, Heather, I think you actually have a couple or there are a